Hey guys, Roger here, pastor of Preaching and Vision at Matthew's Table. We're glad that you decided to join us and tune in to see our service. Uh, I would say that this isn't something that we hope you replace your local church with, but this is something to uh, just build on that and encourage you and help you see Jesus in a bigger, better way. I'm Pastor Nick Martin, Pastor of Discipleship and Outreach, and we pray this just blesses you and grows you in your relationship with Christ. December 30th at 7 p.m., we will have a family meeting. And we'll talk about what we're going to do going into the next year, how we plan to give, how we plan to utilize the building that God has given us, just how we plan to operate. So if you're a committed member of Matthew's Table, come December 30th at 7 p.m. And uh, I'm just going to open us up in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you uh, for your blessed assurance. Thank you for the worship team. Uh, thank you for the people of the church that serve you. Just pray for every church in Owensboro that is preaching the gospel. I pray that we stand united and just wave the flag of Christ. Amen. Amen. I got a question this morning. It's kind of a Facebook debate, a, you know, a family debate on how many of you think it's okay to put your Christmas tree up before Thanksgiving? Not many. Yeah. Heather Penny. <laughs> How many of you think you should wait till after Thanksgiving to put up your Christmas tree? A lot more smarter people. <laughs> no, but uh, for all of you in here that put up your Christmas tree before Thanksgiving, Christmas is now 19 days away. But I'm sure you had a calendar that told you that. Christmas, I must admit, is a Beautiful time of the year where Mariah Carey comes out with a new CD, where we hear short song of the sermon, Mary, did you know, 2,000 times, where the elf on the shelf has to move every single night, and where we get to see our kids run to see what's under the tree. That's a picture of my daughter, Bella. And you can look in her eyes and tell how, she, how excited she was about the present that found itself under the tree. She was so happy and amazed that her brand new Barbie dream house was sitting under there waiting just for her. The thing, it had so many gadgets, it could talk to you, it had an elevator, it had a pool. And she just knew that if she got that Barbie dream house, that she wouldn't want anything else until her birthday. Think about this. The average person in America would spend $995 on Christmas. The United States will spend $1 trillion on gifts this year. Many people will go into the negative to see their kids smile, and one study showed that Americans will go, $1,300 in debt just to see their kids' faces light up. It said that some people can get stuck making monthly payments for three years just to pay off Christmas this year. In the stores, they know how to sell you. They know how to get you, too. Kohl's, if you signed up for a platinum Kohl's credit card, you got 35% off and you got to move to the front of the line. Did you notice that the PlayStation 5 came out right before Christmas? And if you think Black Friday slowed down because we're in the middle of a pandemic, think again. Black Friday hit a new all-time record with people spending $9 billion on Christmas this year in one day. In the middle of big spending, going in debt, and buying new things, it feels great when we say things like, I feel the Christmas spirit. It feels great when we say things like, it's the reason for the season. And we comfort ourselves by saying, hey, they're only young once. Me not meaning to be the Grinch, but I often ask myself, how am I being any different? I ask myself, am I just joining the rat race? 
I often ask myself, considering I serve a Savior who sacrificed, how am I being sacrificial? We'll be taking some time away from our verse-by-verse study in the book of Galatians with our new three-part sermon series titled, The Coming of an Unlikely King. Today, if you have your Bibles, we'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, and hopefully we'll view Christmas in a new lens. There is no empty tomb without the, resu- uh, without the bloody cross. There is no resurrection without the crucifixion, and there is no life without death. Hopefully it puts thing in the, things into proper perspective that the reason for the season is starting out with Jesus was born to die. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. I'm going to read that again. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. That's good news. I asked a question on Facebook this week as as I was preparing for the sermon that went, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of the word sacrifice? Some people said it was their mother who sacrificed. Some said it could be working long hours. Some said putting others' needs before their own, but mainly, like I kind of knew, most everyone said Jesus. And they wasn't wrong. Ephesians 5.2 tells us, And walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us a flagrant flagrant offering and sacrifice to God. Mark 10.45 tells us, But the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve And give his life as a ransom for many. That's sacrifice. John 6, 38. For I come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That's sacrifice. Reading the Bible in these verses, it can be easy to see why Jesus' life and death could be seen as a sacrifice. But I don't know how many times that we dwell on that we're a part of the reason why that sacrifice took place. To put it into perspective, Jesus wasn't just heading to the cross the day he was born or the day he was found guilty. Jesus was headed to the cross since the beginning of time. Jesus on the cross was plan A for sinners. He was born to die. Jesus didn't just pop up on the scene. We can see humility in that he left his throne in heaven to live and die so that we may find life in him. What sin had broken could not be fixed without the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of the baby in a manger in Bethlehem. When we set the stage for the cross, the thorns and the nail-pierced hands, what makes it so graphic and unimaginable is that God put himself there. We benefit from the work that Jesus has done, from the sacrifice he made. His mother couldn't talk him out of it. His friends couldn't change his mind. The story had been written, and Jesus was walking it out. When he says it is finished in John 19.30, he means it is finished. That no other sacrifice would do. No one else could have gotten the job done that the sacrifice had been made. Pastor Paul Tripp puts it this way. Jesus knew the job description, that he came to suffer and die, and he was willing. That's sacrificial love. Before we take a look at the death, let's take a look at the birth, because when 2 Corinthians 8 9 says he was rich, it's just mind-blowing how rich. If you think he needed you, he needs nothing. If you think God God just needs your money, he owns it all. Jesus needed nothing but but to do the will of the Father. And the will of the Father wasn't for his son to play hopscotch. The will of the Father was to put his son on the cross. 
that's graphic. What has me mind blown is that Jesus wasn't in debt to anyone. He needed no one. He made the universe, the stars, the sky, the sun, the galaxies, gravity, air, animals. And what's even more crazy is that he died on a hill he created, on a tree he made grow, by the hands of the people that he formed. Think about this. The stones crowd in worship. The winds and the waves obey his voice. All of heaven worships King Jesus. Bill Gates, Jay-Z, LeBron James, the guy that owns Amazon and all the Walmarts combined couldn't put all their wealth together and hold a fork in his kitchen. Rich in our minds is an understatement. Jesus is the bread of life who doesn't run out. He is the king of kings whose throne is secure. He is the well that never runs dry. He's the firm foundation. And Mary just wasn't holding her son in her hands, but the son of God who was here to save the world. Jesus was born to trade places with Barabbas. Jesus was born to be betrayed. Jesus was born to die. December 25th, the day that we say Jesus has come, the prophesied Messiah is here. The great I am has showed up, has turned into Santa Claus, ho, 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 and reindeer, the Grinch who stole Christmas, and millions and millions of people going into debt. When I asked a question on Facebook, a whole bunch of people said that when they thought of sacrifice, they thought of Jesus. But the question that I've been asking myself and the question I want to ask you is, how come not one person said when they thought of sacrifice that they thought about Christians? Should we not give because he gave? Should we not be generous because he is generous? Should we not be known as the most sacrificial people in the world? The coming of an unlikely king was hard to understand in that Jesus didn't show up on the Forbes list in Buckingham Palace, escorted by a group of armed guards. Jesus showed up in a manger. The richest person in history made himself poor for the people that rebelled against him, for people that mocked him, for the same people that put him on the cross. There was no red carpet entrance. There was no Rolls Royce pulling up. There was no golden palace. The creator of the universe was born to the Virgin Mary, left his kingly throne for a stable to 33 years later finish what he started. The same crowd that would shout, Hosanna, Hosanna, is the sh same crowd that would shout, crucify. And it was no surprise to him. It didn't shock him because he was born to die. God in all of his glory, in all of his riches, put himself on the cross, hung in our places, swapped us uh, places so that in him we can become rich. If that's not the ultimate trade, I don't know what is. You won't find it on Owensboro Marketplace. It wasn't like the number one pick was trading for the number two and number three pick. That would have been understandable. What's crazy is the number one pick left his place for the last person on the bench. What's crazy is the number one pick left his place for the person that didn't make the team. Or even crazier for the person or people that rebelled against him. To make a fair swap is one thing. To die for your enemies is another. The world says... If you have something to offer me, I'll love you and embrace you. Jesus says, if you have nothing to offer me, I'll love you and embrace you. And that's a big difference. When sinners embrace the fact that Jesus made himself poor so that we can become rich, that should change everything. When we see his sacrifice, we should become sacrificial. When we see his generosity, we should become a generous people. We can forgive because he has forgiven us. What Christ has done for us, should, should that not set the tone in what we do for others? What Christ has done for us, 
Should that not set the tone in what we do for others? God in all of his goodness sent Jesus to be born in an unlikely place to an unlikely family to die for an unlikely people. If I was to be honest, I've always felt like that just wasn't me. That he just died for everyone else. If I was to be honest, I've always felt like I'm not some top draft pick. I don't have a, a million outstanding qualities. I don't have in my eyes a good resume. I've been a runaway, a cheater, a liar, a user, a, in jail, broke, prideful, angry, terrible son to my mother, terrible husband to my wife. I've always been just a reckless and felt worthless type of person. I've never once felt worthy to be up here preaching the gospel. I never have felt qualified. I just don't feel like I measure up to other talented people. In my eyes, you got smarter people. You got better speakers, better looking, more talented, with more charisma, with better plans, and, and all more knowledge that all could do a better job than me. In my eyes, my resume is the one that just gets tossed to the side. And because I know a lot of you in here, I know a lot of you have felt the same way. That you just don't measure up. That you're just not worth it. That you're just not good enough. The insanity of the gospel is that God didn't die for well-polished, put-together people. Romans 5.8 tells us that God died for sinners. Over and over in the Bible, it's people dropping the ball, people making a mess of things, and God calling people back to himself. The Bible isn't some story about how people are great and have it all under control. The Bible is a story about how God is great and how he has it under control. If you don't believe me, read your Bible. David was a cheater. David was a murderer. Peter denied Christ. Paul hunted down Christians. Matthew was a hated tax collector. The woman at the well, do I need to keep going? There's a long list of unqualified people in the Bible. Matthew's table. We are an unlikely church. I am an unlikely pastor sitting in an unlikely building, worshiping the coming of an unlikely king. And God knew that since the beginning of time. If that's not radical, I don't know what is. If you would have told me five years ago I would be preaching, man, I would have laughed at you. If you would have told me 10 years ago I would be in ministry, I would have thought you needed a drug test and that you was insane. If you would have told me that God saves sinners, I would have said all of them but Nick Martin. In my head, Nick Martin was hopeless. In my head, Nick Martin was too far gone. In my head, Nick Martin was worthless. But God said, that's the one I want. He's poor. I'm rich. Take my richness. I'm trading places with you. God trades our filthy rags for his righteousness. And there is no better news. Jesus was born to die for sinners, and I'm on a long list of them. And one of the craziest things that I think we can do is either A, we don't need him, or B, we think that's for everyone else. Let's read 2 Corinthians 8 9 again. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. That's an ultimate swap out. The question I want you all to ponder on, the question I want you to ask yourselves though, how has that changed you in the way you live? How does that change the way you worship? How does that change the way you sacrifice? How has it changed us when we see God is generous and full of grace? If you didn't know it, we live in the richest country in the world. We're about to go blow thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on toys that will end up in a yard sale. 
We spend and we spend and we spend on the newest phone, newest TV, newest game system, newest shoes, and the list goes on and on and on. But shouldn't we as Christians live differently, though? Shouldn't the fact that we worship a sacrificial Savior make us want to be some sacrificial people? Shouldn't we be known for our sacrifice? That's what I've asked my family this year. That's what I've I prayed about. God, how can we be different? How can we be sacrificial? How can we use what we have for the glory of God? Is it what Roger said? Should we put some money to the side for the adoption that we're going to give to? What can we do different? And by the way, if a church just sacrificed half of what we're going to get our kids for Christmas, an adoption would already be paid for. If a church just sacrificed half of what it's getting for Christmas, no kids will be hungry. If a church has sacrificed half of what we're going to do for Christmas, no kids will go without presents. What are we going to do different? I read this earlier this week. Consider the heart issue this way. If an agent dragged you into court and accused you of loving Jesus, could your checkbook and credit cards be summoned as evidence against you? If auditors examined your finances, would they find proof of your love for God? And here's what really cut me deep. If our vacation and restaurant bills exceed our giving, what might that be signifying? Man, that was like a knife in my side that kept turning and turning. It cut me deep. And if you're tuning me out right now, because you think I'm talking about money, you should tune back in because I'm talking about your heart. Jesus never, Jesus never shied away from talking about money because he knows it's directly tied to what you love. If you see a bunch of restaurants on your bank statement, you probably love eating out. If you see a bunch of Starbucks on your bank statement, you probably love a cup of coffee. If you see hucks over and over on your bank statement, you probably love a big swig of Red Bull and cigarettes. <laughs> or gas at the pump. <laughs> Whatever it is you love, check your bank statement, and I bet you will find it. Think about this. We live in a country where no one thinks they're rich. And no one thinks they're greedy. We just want more and more and more for ourselves. And we wonder why we raise a generation of spoiled kids. We lie to ourselves and think, when I get my savings account set up, after I buy my big house and my car payments and my white picket fence and my kids' Christmas and my restaurant bills, then I'll be able to give some. We're lying to ourselves. I was struggling if I should even talk about this because I know what people think when you talk about money. But I got a call from a, a friend as I was praying and thinking about this sermon. I was reading all the numbers on money that would be spent for just Christmas this year, and I knew that my family was in the same boat. I knew that I was a part of the stats. I knew what we was going to spend equaled what they said. My friend said, Nick, I was a part of something today that opened my eyes. He said, I met someone in need, and all they needed was some jackets for their kids and plastic to put up over their window to keep the coat out. He said all they needed was some jackets for their kids and plastic for their windows to keep the coat out. He got it for them, and he said, Nick, they was just happy that I showed up. They was just happy that I was sacrificial. I asked him, I said, how much did you spend? He said, $22. And he said, man, they were so joyful that they had jackets for their kids and plastic for their windows. Church, God calls us to be generous people. God calls us to be sacrificial people. I'm so thankful to be a part of a church that goes 
I'm thankful to be a part of a church that gives. I'm thankful to be a part of a church that doesn't ask if Thanksgiving outreach and Christmas outreach is too much, but what else can we do? 1 John 4.19 says, We love because He first loved us. Church, we are generous because He is generous. We sacrifice because of His sacrifice. We've said this from day one, but I'm going to reaffirm it since we've got the building now. We said if a building doesn't allow us to be missional, then we will stay at the Monday Center where we have to pack up chairs and set up for church each, each week. It's not about us and what we can do for us. It's about Christ and His kingdom. We're not building and waving the flag of Matthew's table. We're waving the flag of Christ, our sacrificial Savior. What does sacrifice look like? It looks like Jesus on a cross. It looks like nail-pierced hands. It looks like a crown of thorns in his head. It looks like being born to die. It looks like pick up your cross and follow me. Picking up a cross ain't easy. Picking up a cross is sacrificial. Picking up a cross is hard. Carrying a cross is hard. Carrying a cross is sacrificial. But when we see what he has done, we should follow in those footsteps. Christians are the richest people in the world because he made us rich in him. Our father is rich in mercy. Our father is rich in love. Our father is rich in forgiveness. Our father is rich in grace. Anything else you're placing your hope in is fool's gold. Anything else you're trusting in is fool's gold. Anything else you're running to is fool's gold. Your father is rich in mercy. Your father is rich in forgiveness. Your father is rich in grace. Your father is rich in love. That's some great news. Whatever you're running to, it's not going to fulfill you. Whatever you're running to, it'll leave you empty. Take his richness and trade places. Worship team, you can make your way up. I got a crazy story to tell y'all. And if I wasn't a part of it, it would almost be so too crazy to believe. She came into my life out of nowhere. She was the sweetest lady I'd ever met in my life. She was about 60 years old, as nice as, I could, as, nice as could be. But honestly, I just thought this lady was crazy and blowing smoke. She walked into my shop one day and said, I'm looking for a guy named Nick. Me being Larry, it was a bill collector or a setup. I reluctantly said, how are you? I'm Nick. She said, oh, wow. God told me to come to this place. God led me to find you. And he told me to be a blessing in your life. I wasn't a Christian then. So I just thought if this was some weird lady and it was just a, a weird coincidence that there was a Nick in the room. She talked to me on and on and on. She said, Nick, God sent me here. She said she wanted to be a blessing in my life because God had told her to do so. She said, hey, Nick, I have a garage full of things you could use. Me being me, I thought it was all junk, and she was using me to haul off some stuff to the dump. So I lied to her, and I said, sure, lady, I'll be right there. I blew this lady off week after week. I ignored her. I thought I would never see this psycho crazy lady again who said she wanted to be a blessing in my life. But she came back the next week and said, hey, how come you didn't stop by? I told you God sent me to be a blessing. He told me to give you all the stuff I have and to be there for you. Me being stubborn and hard-headed and not trusting people, I kept telling her week after week I'll stop by, and I did it. Whatever I thought about this lady that she was crazy, I was wrong. 
when she wouldn't let me keep ignoring her, I showed up at her house one day. She said, Nick, I think you'll be interested in the stuff I have in my garage. To my amazement, this lady had owned a Christian bookstore and had just retired and said, I want to give you all my stuff. It was all brand new Bibles, brand new crosses, brand new necklaces, bracelets, anything and everything you could think of that a Christian bookstore would have. Me being stubborn still and thinking I was at a yard sale, I said, hey, lady, how much? She laughed and said, Nick, I told you I'm going to be a blessing in your life. It's free. The calculator then went off in my head about how much money I could make, and this lady became my new pretend best friend. Shortly after that, I got married, and this lady slid me an envelope with $500. Shortly after that, we had Bella, and this lady slid me another envelope with $500. But you know what's crazy about this story to me? I wasn't a Christian. I was reckless. I was wild. I was the last person that deserved this lady's sacrifice. I did not, I don't deserve it one bit. And a matter of fact, I thought this lady was a fool for giving me anything. That lady could have given that stuff to any church. She could have found anyone to be a blessing to. And here she was in my life saying, I want to be a blessing to Nick Martin. Sadly, because my stubbornness, and I didn't know any better, I haven't seen this lady in years, but the sacrifice she made in me, I couldn't thank her enough. I often wonder, does this lady know I'm a pastor today? I often wonder, how long did this lady pray for me? I often wonder, why did this lady even care? I now know that she cared about me because Christ cares about me. That she was generous because he is generous. That she sacrificed because he is sacrificial. That's what the body of Christ should be known for. That's what we should be known for. That's what you should be known for if you say you're in Christ. How did that change me? I realized God loved me long before I loved myself. God on the cross looked into the future and said, Nick Martin is a sinner. Nick Martin drops the ball. Nick Martin needs my hope and forgiveness, and I'm here to pay it for him. Church, how can you ever, ever repay that? You can't repay nail-pierced hands. You can't repay a Savior on the cross. How can we not see that by His poverty we have been made rich? How does that not change us in the way we worship, in the way we give, in the way we sacrifice, in the way we live our lives? How do we see His example and then we just go live a normal day? God loves you enough, church, to say, let go of what's in your hands. Let go of the things you're trusting in. Let go of the things you're hoping in. Let go of the unforgiveness you have in your heart. Let go of greed, but mainly just let go of yourself. Let go. The posture with God shouldn't be closed fists. It should be open fists. Letting go of the things that hold us back from Him. Church, quit trusting in yourself and run to our sacrificial Savior. The baby in the manger fulfilled everything spoken of Him. He accomplished what He came to do. We must repent and believe in the finished work of the cross and turn to Him to lead Him and to guide us. The bad news is, church, you couldn't do enough. The better news is, he done it for you. In His love and kindness, He paid the price you couldn't pay. He built the bridge to God that you couldn't build. And He paid the debt that you owed. Sinners earn death. Christ gave us life, and that's something to worship. There is no resurrection without the crucifixion. There is no empty tomb without a bloody cross. And there is no death without the birth. Jesus Christ is the only reason for the season. 
He is the only reason we worship, the reason we trust, the reason we sacrifice, the reason we have hope, the reason we give, because by His poverty, we have been made rich. Matthew's table, that should cause us to worship. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed the sermon. If you guys would like to stay connected to us and what we're doing, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or you can like us on Facebook. You can also visit our website at matthewstableonesboro.com. A cool feature on our website is we have a prayer wall. You can place your prayer on there and someone will be praying for you. To partner with us financially, you can text the number 73256 with Matthew's Table with no space in between. Because of your giving, we can be a missional church that reaches the lost and goes hits the streets for Jesus. Thank you.